Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Composting at Home, an introduction to the basics. I'm Linda Bilsons Brolis, the manager of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance's Composter Training Programs, and I'll be your host and facilitator today. Today's webinar features my colleague, Brenda Platt, along with international vermicomposting expert, Rhonda Sherman with North Carolina State University. Brenda will cover the basics of home composting outside, and R Rhonda will discuss worm composting. Uh, before we get started, uh, let me say a few words about the Institute. Um, we are a national nonprofit founded in 1974 that challenges concentrated economic power and champions broadly distributed ownership of resources and decision making that is accountable to communities. Uh, we foster greater internet connectivity through locally owned broadband networks. We counter monopo monopolies and support independent businesses, local banking, distributed renewable energy generation, and we advance locally based recycling, reuse, and composting. If you haven't already seen it, our co-director Stacy Mitchell was recently featured on the front page of the New York Times business section about our work challenging Amazon's concentrated power. Uh, check out ILSR's website for more info, and please remember it's more important than ever to support your local independent businesses, which are literally fighting, to, fighting for survival today. So uh, Brenda and I, along with our colleague Virginia Streeter, make up the Institute's Composting for Community Initiative team, which is bringing you today's webinar. Thanks to Virginia for handling the tech for us today. Uh, we have many resources available on our website. Uh, yes in My Backyard, for instance, is a guide specifically to help local government institute home composting programs. Community Composting Done Right is a guide on best management practices for community scale composting. Uh, <clears throat> we support the growing movement of small-scale composters via forums, workshops, coalition building, a podcast series, and more. And we also developed a composter training program to help increase the success of those composting at the community scale. Uh, let us know if you're interested in adapting our program to your community. Um, and this slide will show uh, that we offer webinars like today's on many topics connected to composting such, a, such as using Bokashi in community composting or how to structure your community composting enterprise. Uh, next slide will show less, last fall that we offered a series of webinars focused on the ways compost can help fight climate destruction. Definitely check those out. They feature a lot of great experts on the topic. Um, and in the next slide, we'll show if you go to our website, ilsr.org forward slash composting, you will see a resources link on the right hand side. From there, you can select reports, podcasts, webinars, and more. On Earth Day, we launched new home composting resources, which are pictured here, and uh, which we will be hearing a lot more about today. But first, Let's take a moment to get to know you, our audience. Um, the next slide will show uh, that as of yesterday, we had just over a thousand folks registered uh, for this webinar. Now we have significantly more, uh, but most of you, uh, based on the responses that you gave with registration, most of you are home gardeners. You also have a number of government agency folks, concerned citizens, teachers, and those affiliated with public interest nonprofits. 95% of you are based in the United States, representing 42 states, plus the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico. But we also have participants from more than 20 other countries, including Tunisia, Zambia, Peru, Bangladesh, and Romania. So welcome, everyone. Um, and the next slide will show that in order uh, to, uh, the next slide will show uh, when we asked the question about your experience level uh, between one to five uh, with home composting, one being zero experience. Uh, this is how you all answered. 5% uh, were very confident of their home composting ability and the rest were split between new to composting and having some experience but wanting to learn more. That's a pretty good mix. Now, finally, um, to today's presentation. Um, we had almost 13 people, 1,300 people register for this event, 
So as you probably already noticed, everyone is in listen-only mode. Normally, we would invite you to submit your questions via the GoToWebinar panel on your screen, but we already had more than 1,000 questions submitted through the registration process. Um, as such, Brenda and Rhonda will address the most common questions in their presentations. If you have any clarifying questions on what's being said during the presentations, feel free to send them in via that, that box, that GoTo control panel, GoTo webinar control panel. But again, our apologies, is in, our apologies in advance if we don't get to them. Um, one question I can address now. Yes, a recording of this webinar will be sent to you and will be posted on our website. So now, while we are getting Brenda set up to take over the controls, I'll go ahead and introduce her. Brenda will speak for about 30 minutes and she will be followed by Rhonda. Uh, Brenda is the director of ILSR's Composting for Community Initiative. She has been a home composter for more than 30 years, licensed twice in Maryland to operate commercial scale sites, and is a lead trainer for ILSR's Neighborhood Soil, Rebuild Soil Rebuilders Composter Train the Trainer program. She has researched and authored numerous reports on reuse, recycling, and composting, including Stop Trashing the Climate, which is as timely as ever. She has received national recognition for her work in composting by the U.S. Composting Council and BioCycle Magazine. So without further ado, Brenda, take it away. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Linda. Thanks, Virginia, for doing tech. And thanks to all of you for joining us today. This is very exciting to see so much interest in home composting. Um, I am not a master gardener like many of you, and but this is my little patch of, of garden. Um, I have very little of my yard that's um, in full sun to grow things. So I have this little strip in the front along my driveway, but I do plant, I think, quite a lot. I have milkweed, asters, echinacea, several types of flowers, a few tomatoes, hot peppers. My family loves to make salsa and I do lots and lots of herbs. So I just, one thing I just wanna emphasize at the beginning here is, you know, um, composting is a great way to reduce waste and you don't have to be a master gardener to use it in your yard um, like me. So, um, but let's start with the very basics. What actually is compost? And this is a picture of my homemade compost. Just last week, I screened some. And it's a dark, crumbly, earthy smelling material produced by the natural decomposition of organic materials. So it's a bio composting is a biological process. Microorganisms convert the organic materials like leaves, kitchen scraps, yard trimmings into a soil enhancer called compost, which is full of beneficial microbes and really rich in organic matter. Now, nature does the same process, but if we control certain conditions, the materials are gonna decompose quicker. And with good management, you can compost without creating any of those odor problems that so many of you are concerned about. So um, it's, um, this graphic shows the diverse organisms that thrive in a compost pile, and they're both micro and macro organisms, and really compost occurs through their efforts. And I just love this graphic because it really just shows the diversity, and I love to celebrate diversity, and conditions in your compost pile will change. Um, even within the pile, they're different. And so what this diversity is really helps the process to continue uh, during many different conditions many different conditions. Now the first degree decomposers, these are shown by this number one with the degree sign. Um, uh, those are the first level decomposers. They're the bacteria, the fungi, actinomycetes, which are really rod-shaped bacteria that form filaments like fungi. Now the bacteria are the most numerous and they generally um, are faster decomposers than the fungi, which are larger microorganisms. And the fungi are more tolerant of low moisture and low pH conditions, but they don't like low oxygen conditions. The fungi are also better at decomposing more woody materials, but the bacteria really fl flourish in the early stages of composting. And it's near the end of the composting process that you're gonna have the fungi and the actin actinomycetes really come in. Composting, and I cannot emphasize this enough, composting is really all about making these microbes happy. Now, as these microbes consume the materials in the compost pile, the pile's gonna heat up 
and more to come on that, but as your pile cools, it will become inhabited by common soil microorganisms, protozoa, worms, mites, insects, and a lot of the other larger organisms, organisms that you're seeing here, and they feed on the microorganisms and the organic matter. So those are the second and third degree decomposers. So it, your compost pile is just full of billions and billions of micro and macro organisms. Okay, so one thing that I also need to emphasize, it's really all about the soil. Compost is not soil, it's a soil amendment, but it has so many benefits to the soil. There's, it improves soil tilth, soil fertility, suppresses plant disease, improves what's called cation exchange capacity, which is the ability of soil to retain nutrients. It helps soil retain water. It enhances soil structure. This is um, a poster that we, part of a poster actually that we've produced, and we have several, by the way, on our website on the many benefits of of, of composting to soil and other things, jobs too. So you can feel free to download, print, share, they're all available for free. The Symphony of Soil I just wanna share here is just an amazing uh, movie. Uh, for all you gardeners out, out, gardeners out there, you will love this movie. So just wanna encourage you to check it out. Another reason to compost is its ability to um, offset greenhouse gases and sequester carbon in the soil. So if you're concerned about the climate, composting is really a win-win activity that virtually everyone can do. So when food scraps end up in a landfill, they contribute to methane emissions, which is a very uh, potent greenhouse gas. If you're sending, if you're in a community that's sending its waste to a trash incinerator, incineration also produces climate and other pollutants. But when compost is added to the soil, it provides critical organic matter and a carbon sink, storing carbon in the soil. Compost improves plant growth, which increases photosynthesis, so it's helping draw down carbon from the atmosphere, storing it in the soil. There was one study, extensive study that was done in California, the Marin Carbon Farming Project, that found that applying just a half inch of compost to rangelands had tremendous ability to store carbon and they repeated that study with a quarter inch of compost and they found the same results. This is a, a photo of that uh, research where they're applying um, yard yard trimming compost to, to rangelands. You can kind of visually see that. And Linda mentioned our webinar series on the compost climate connections. We did five of them so I refer you to more information if uh, for you to those webinars if you want more information. Okay, so another huge reason, reason to think about composting at home is to reduce your, your garbage, right? That you're setting out the curb. And on average, this is based on, on the United States, on figures in the US, US, about half of what we are putting at the curb for disposal. This does not include what's already you know, recycled or composted in the US, but what we're still disposing in the US about half of it is readily compostable, and 21% is food scraps alone. So there's a tremendous ability to cut waste through composting and doing it at home. We made this graphic uh, for Earth Day, and it kind of highlights at least the top 10 reasons to compost. I've mentioned most of these. One thing I'll just say is, you know, it builds community resilience and power. You know, if you're improving your local soils, if you're doing it at a garden or school, um, so that's important, and as I said before, it's something virtually everyone can do. And one of the things to know about composting, which I love about it, is there's there's so many ways to do it. There's no one way, there's no one system, there's no one bin, as I'll show you in a minute. It can be large-scale industrial sites and very small-scale, you know, you know, worm bin in a classroom or in your home, as, as Rhonda will talk about, and literally everything, everything in between. So um, this shows some, this is on farm, we have community garden, we have a horse farm, uh, the, these bins right here on the top um, is at a retreat center, uh, we have in-vessel systems is at a school, and of course there's, there's home composting. So how important is home composting? Well, I, I'll tell you, I think it's very important. We produce this um, hierarchy of, of ways to manage food waste. Uh, that I think is the only one that's out there that takes into account, kind of looking at it through a lens of local and scale. So of course, at the top of the hierarchy is reducing food waste, don't generate it in the first place. And then we would like our institutions 
you know, to rescue food that can still be, um, that's still edible for people and maybe for livestock as well. But then for residential food scraps, we should be promoting home composting first. And then after that, we have like small scale decentralized, community based farmers before we even get to larger scale facilities. And one of the things that we found in a report we did a, a few years ago called Yes in My Backyard, it's a home, com home composting guide. Uh, oriented for local government. It features local government supported programs. So one of our findings is that for every 10,000 households home composting, an estimated 1,400 tons per year could be diverted from you know, landfills and incinerators. And using average U.S. disposal fees at landfills, you know, that could translate into $72,000 per year in savings. But with training and support, the tonnage would grow and the savings could jump up to a quarter million dollars. This is US dollars, of course. Our key takeaways from that report is provide bins, make them accessible, and set people up for success with a little bit of education and training. You don't need a lot. Um, your community, especially if you're in an urban area, might have some old antiquated ordinances that basically say, oh, you can't harbor trash in your backyard. So you may need to. Um, look at how to address that. Um, that was done in Washington, D.C., for instance, so um, to allow home composting to proceed. So we have some models for that, and they're in this report, so check, check that out if you're interested. Okay, so let's talk about home composting bins. A lot of you asked, how can I do this cheaply? What kind of bins should I be using? How do I know what size? So we're going to run through some of this for you and give you some examples. Now, if you Google home composting bins, you will be overwhelmed with options. Uh, wire bins are a great low budget method. They can be very low cost. If you, and they're, I think especially um, could work really well if you're just looking at composting yard trimmings. Uh, they're a good option. If you're in an urban area with what I call rat pressure, meaning there's already rats in your neighborhood, um, as a lot of our urban cities have, this is not going to be ideal for you. So keep that in mind. And of course, you can have open piles too. If you're in a really rural area or you have a huge yard and you don't have problems with critters, you can compost in, in, a, in a big pile. Uh, one of the reasons to have a bin is it helps kind of contain things, helps it heat up. Um, and as you'll see, there's no one way to do this. Another low cost option is, is using repurposing wooden pallets. And again, if you Google, pallet compost bins, you're going to find many different links and some of them, you know, are really open, some are more fancy like this one um, on the on the bottom right. Uh, three bin, you know, these kind of multi-bin cube systems are very popular. They've been around for, you know, decades. Uh, I have built a three bin system that I use for probably 20 years. I, I love these um, kind of three bin systems or multi bin systems. And one of the things that they're great about is they can hold a lot of material versus the smaller tumblers or stationary systems that I'll show you in a minute. So it can really help it to heat up. Um, so if you're handy or you can make one of these, this might be a great option for you if you have the space. It also is a good option if you have a lot of yard trimmings. You know, this question of how do I know which system to choose really depends on. Um, you know, do you have a lot of yard waste? Uh, you know, do you have space to build this? You know, what kind of, what are your space considerations? So that's gonna, you know, really impact which one you choose. And even with these multi-systems, you can see there's no one way to do it. Some are open, some have lids, some you can actually buy, they're expensive if you buy them already put together like this one. Um, some actually aren't even cubes, uh, but I we do like if you're in an area with, uh, again, rodent pressure, is looking for something that's enclosed, that's wrapped in a quarter inch hardware cloth. It's like a wire mesh. Um, a quarter inch will keep out mice and, and, and rats too. So, and of course, other critters like raccoons. It's not just, not just rodents. Uh, these are stationary um, bins and many of these are available to purchase. Most are made from recycled plastic. One thing I'll just share is that the Institute for Local Self-Reliance does not recommend any specific brand. Now these are mostly designed so you can harvest from the bottom. And for senior citizens, we had a number of questions about uh, for the older generation, what would be good to work to, to use. This may be a good option because you know you don't need to do any heavy lifting. You can um, harvest from the bottom. You can 
you know, lift up the bin and move it and rebuild your pile. Um, but it, it could be um, a little easier than, say, some of these tumblers. And depending on which one, you know, if you're getting a big one, it could actually, you know, be a little effort to turn it. In fact, one of the things um, that we know is that the ones that are vertically oriented, like this one up here at the top second to the right, you know, once it's fully loaded with compost, it's actually hard to turn it. So some are easier than others. If you're looking at a tumbler, do do read the reviews because um, it really, um, you know, the people who are reviewing these will tell you it's hard to turn or give you some insight on how hard it is to assemble. They do tend to be a little bit more expensive than some, some of the other systems, but they can work really well. If you don't have a lot of space, you're in an urban area with, you know, you're concerned about rats, they're off the ground, they're fully enclosed. Some of these work well even in bear country, so not all of them. And if you're concerned about cost, you can build your own too. I mean, there's the bottom two photos so show um, barrels, tumblers that were made, it were, you know, do-it-yourself uh, versions. And a lot of the designs, people share their do-it-yourself designs, so you can you can Google Google this and find some that you like. Um, I'll talk about the need for sufficient volume in order to do home composting effectively in a few minutes, but while I'm showing these, I'll just mention it here that the smaller, they come in different sizes, and the smaller systems are harder to get hot. So, um, you can also read the reviews about that. And some of them are designed with dual chambers, as you can see in many of these pictures. And that's um, designed that way so that you could let one side finish composting and then start a new composting pile in, a, in the second side. And But what happens then is you've now cut your volume in half. So again, it's maybe harder to get it hot. So these are just some things to think about. They also tend to be batch systems. So you, you know you can't harvest at the bottom. So you have to like fill it up and you have to unload it. So just think about some of those things and we can we can talk more about that. Okay. So no matter what system you use or what scale you are composting at, even if you're a large scale industrial composter, you need to know about this, the, good, the ingredients for good compost. All living things need oxygen, all living things need water, and the microbes in the compost pile need air and water too, and they also need food. So we'll talk more about more in detail about the food, but for now, you may be familiar with these terms. It's, you know, greens and browns and mixing them in the proper proportions. And what that refers to is greens refer to materials that are relatively high in nitrogen, and that'll be your raw vegetable and food scraps, your grass clippings, fresh grass clippings are high in nitrogen. Coffee grounds are high in nitrogen, even though they're not green and they're brown, so don't get confused about that. Now, browns are materials that are relatively high in carbon, and that includes leaves, twigs, wood chips, wood shavings, straw, shredded newspaper. And you're going to want a mix of things if you can. You cannot, you can't really compost very well with just food scraps and shredded newspaper, and I'll talk more about why, but it has to do with the airflow through the pile and the porosity of the pile, how dense or light it is. So newspaper, if you're just using newspaper, might make it too dense and not create those air pockets that you need. Okay, so this is, if you can manage these ingredients, uh, you can do composting pretty well. Okay, so a lot of you want to know, like, how much labor is this? How much effort do I need to do? And what I can tell you is this. You can compost in your home, in your backyard, I mean, you know, um, at whatever level you want to put into it. And if you want to do a low effort with little attention, you don't want to have to water, you don't want to have to turn every week, you know, you just want nature to take its course, that's fine. You know, it will be slower. It could take a year for you to have finished compost. You won't reach those high temperatures. So you may have wheat seeds persisting. You, you may have more volunteer tomato plants. Um, if you do a little bit more attention, and we're going to go through these things, the air, the water, the carbon to nitrogen materials, the recipe, making your microbes happy, you know, might mean 
turning your pile more regularly. It might mean having an adequate volume to be able to hold that heat. You want um, the moisture. You can, you'll reach high temperatures sufficient enough to prevent weed seeds from germinating and to prevent pathogens from being a problem. And you also have the benefit of having quicker compost, like within two to three months, even if you're really optimizing your conditions. So those, that's the benefit and the difference. But just know that you can do composting passively and it'll probably just be fine. The secret to composting is air, it's oxygen. Composting is an aerobic process, meaning it needs, the microbes need oxygen. If it goes anaerobic, meaning it has starved oxygen conditions, then you're gonna get anaerobic bacteria. And so it's you might have more smells and you will have more smells actually. So turning does a lot of things and it adds not only does it add oxygen, but it breaks up materials, it fluffs, it shreds, you know, it just is going to invigorate your pile. And so that's why turning is helpful. Your best friend in this, if you're not doing a tumbler, but you're doing other, you know, kind of the, the other systems, is going to be a pitchfork. That's my pitchfork. I love it. Uh, if you already have a pitchfork, you don't need to get a new one. But if you want to buy a pitchfork, I recommend that you look at compost pitchforks or manure pitchforks. What they are is the tines um, are rounded, sharper points, and the it's, it's actually a scoop, scooped tines. So it's just rather than a typical garden pitchfork, which has flat tines and whatnot. So just something to consider. If you have a tumbler, it's the tumbling that breaks and mixes things up. You don't necessarily need a, a pitchfork for that for that part of it. Okay, so one of the things to keep in mind is that the cool air comes into your pile through the bottom and comes through the pile and as we know, warm, hot air rises. So this is the flow of the air through any, any pile. And so you always want to think about how you're going to create air spaces not too much because you still want the microbes to be working. You know, you don't want like a pile of straw, nothing's going to happen, obviously. But think about the airflow through the pile when you first make your pile. We'll talk a little bit more about that, actually, I guess right now. So one of the things that I like to do is with my cuttings from my, my garden, and this is like, I don't know, daylily stalks and a little bit of rosemary branches um, that I trimmed, you know, thin twigs, I break them up, put them at the bottom of the pile, you know, if you were if you were building a campfire outside, you would never just put all your logs flat against the ground. You need that airflow. So you want the same thing to emulate that in your compost pile at the bottom, is to create that airflow, whether it's wood chips or twigs, and then build your pile on top of that as well. Um, this is a picture on the right of some wet leaves, which are a great source of carbon in, in the pile, but this happened to be wet and matted. And if I had laid that flat in my compost pile, you know, would create this layer that prevents the air from circulating. So you don't need a shredder. In 30 years of home composting, I have never shredded my leaves, but I do break it up and keep in mind the air float through the pile and it'll break down just fine. Okay, so I'm sharing um, uh, sharing this uh, <laughs> um, um, uh, graphic to, you know, science has given us basically two uh, names for the temperature ranges within which certain microorganisms thrive. And in the 50 to 105 degrees Fahrenheit, um, it's the mesophilic temperature range. When you reach 105, you know, over 105, 104, um, it's the thermophilic temperature range. The 110 to the 155 degrees is really the desired range for composting. That's where you're going to destroy more pathogens, fly larvae, and weed seeds. You need 145 degrees Fahrenheit to prevent most weed seeds from germinating. And I think tomato seeds, it's closer to 154, which is probably why we have so many volunteer tomato plants in our piles. But 131 degrees is what's needed to kill most human pathogens. And you need to reach 131 degrees for three continuous contingent days in order to do that. So what happens is the microbes are eating the organic matter, and as they you know produce energy, they're 
you know, consuming it, they're producing energy, they're giving off heat. So the process itself is producing the heat. You don't need sunlight to produce the heat. That's a myth. It's the microbes that are doing that. But during that process, they drive off the moisture, they destroy the pathogens, they destroy the weed seeds. And so then you may, we'll talk about it, need to add more moisture when that happens. Now, you end up back in the mesophilic stage during the curing process. And curing is critical and too often neglected. The compost needs time to mature and become stable. And you more or less know when that's when it's ready for that, when the temperature no longer heat, heats up after you turn it. So then curing can begin. And a rule of thumb is that you need basically a month for the compost to, to finish curing and become stable and mature. All right, so now let's just move on to um, what materials can you compost at home versus not? And this is really important. So First of all, let's just go through the no list. You don't want um, cooked foods, cheese and dairy, meat and bones. And the reason for that is they tend to, to create more, can create more odor problems. Uh, rodents like proteins. So if you put meat, if you want to, if you're concerned about rats in particular, do not put meat and bones, fish either, cheese and dairy cooked foods in your pile, okay? Um, you want to, and oily and greasy stuff too kind of uh, fits in with that. You want to avoid uh, painted or treated wood. It can have toxins on it. If you have aggressive weeds or grasses or any diseased or poisonous plants, best to leave those out. Um, pet waste, especially, you know, pets like cats and dogs that eat meat can have uh, pathogens in their waste, so we don't want that in our compost pile, especially if you're using your compost, you know, for growing um, uh, uh, food and produce and vegetables. So, you know, there probably are some systems if you want to keep it completely separate that you can do if you're concerned about that. But if you're just starting out and you have any doubt about any material, leave it out. Just err on the side of just being safe, okay, is what I want to emphasize. Okay, so you want to balance um, your carbon, carbon and nitrogen and the greens and browns. So the greens, like I said before, you're mostly your fresh vegetable and fruit scraps. That's going to be most of what you generate. Now, if you have um, cut flowers, you can put those in. Eggshells are fine. You can help them out by just giving them a crush first uh, before you put them in your bin. Coffee grounds, I mentioned. Filters are okay. Tea bags, just remove the staples. Um, browns tend to be kind of more your woody material, so plant stalks, twigs, branches. We don't recommend uh, hay because it tends to have seeds in it, so straw, not hay, um, and untreated straw. And fall leaves are great. One of the challenges you're going to have at this time of year, uh, if you're starting out, is, um, is making sure you have a lot of browns. Um, in your, you know, to compost. You cannot compost, you can compost leaves and, and materials high in carbon, your browns, but you cannot compost materials high in nitrogen. And I'll talk about that actually kind of right now, the importance of uh, carbon and nitrogen. The microbes need carbon for energy and growth. They need nitrogen for protein and reproduction. And in general, Biological organisms, including humans, need 25 to 30 times more carbon than nitrogen. So you need to supply the carbon and nitrogen in the right proportions. And the ratio of carbon to nitrogen is referred to as the CN ratio. Now, when we do a longer class, we go into this much more and how you can do, you know, if you like math, or you can do math, there's online calculators. But really what you need to know today is that providing and mixing materials with a starting carbon to nit nitrogen ratio of 30 is really what's ideal. And so if you have too much nitrogen, like in your food scraps, then you have the excess nitrogen is converted to ammonia or nitrous oxide, and then odors can become a problem. So that's why if you ever have odors, when in doubt, add more carbon, more browns. So a lot of composting is like um, is is uh, like uh, cooking, you know, like you're making a pot of soup, you know. So much, you know, there's a lot of science and, and, and this kind of stuff, but there's also, it's really, so much of it is the art of doing. And it's gonna vary depending on what you have available to you. If you have fall leaves, that, you know, fall leaves, 
if you're in an area with fall leaves, it is just a tremendous resource for home composting. Now, the carbon-nitrogen ratio is 30 to 80. If your source of carbon is going to be more wood chips, that carbon to nitrogen ratio is shown here in this table, you know, is higher than leaves, it's 100 to 500. But the other thing you have to consider in your carbon source, your brown source, is that is the rate at which the carbon is available, the rate at which it can decompose. So just think about like straw. Straw is going to break down faster than a, a tree that's just been tripped chipped and it's new, fresh, that kind of blonde wood chips, you know, yellow wood chips versus, you know, already decaying. So the, the wood chips are really important to add to your, can be important to add to your pile because they add kind of a, they bulk the pile up, they they increase that, that porosity, that airspace, so it's good to have some wood chips. But if you're only using wood chips, especially if they're new, it's not going to be available. So this is where it's like cooking. You'll see what your source is. Maybe you've shredded wood. Maybe your local public works shreds leaves, and you can go get leaf mulch to help, a mix of that. So it really depends. Now, if you're a little overwhelmed by all of this, this is the CN ratio, I should say, is a dry weight basis. So it's kind of a chemical, you know, um, thing. We have a nice rule of thumb for you, so you don't have to necessarily worry about that too much unless you really want to do a deeper dive. So the rule of thumb is that for every bucket or wheelbarrow of greens that you have, you want to add by volume is two to three parts of browns to one part of greens, okay? Now, some people can do one-to-one. -one. You definitely don't want to go less than one-to-one, -one. so two to three parts browns to one part of greens. Um, if you are a little wary of doing kitchen scraps and you just want to have a big yard, you're a master gardener, like my friend Susan here, this is her wheelbarrow, a lot of your um, yard trimmings may already be a good mix of greens and browns, and you can you do that. Maybe you have pumpkins in the fall. It's a good source of, of, of nitrogen. Uh, rich material. Okay, so preparing your materials is really important. You want to, the microbes work on the surface area to break it down. So if you put a whole corn cob, it's not going to break down. It's not a problem. You'll just keep putting it in. Eventually it might, but you can help it out by chopping it. And the best time to chop is when you've got that on your cutting board. So citrus, um, you can put in your compost pile. You can help it out by breaking it, breaking it up to get that surface area. Um, this, uh, these pictures are from Earth Matter. If you're doing yard waste, you know, some questions to consider whether you want to put it in or not. Are the seeds mature? Yes, leave it out. Will your plant propagate by root? Leave it out. If you're not sure, leave it out. Uh, you want to remove those produce stickers. You want to remove staples from tea bags. Um, you might ask, well, how do I collect my scraps in my kitchen. There are many pails available. Uh, generally, they have lids that helps avoid any problems with fruit flies. Uh, you know, they're metal, bamboo, plastic. You can use an old pot. Uh, this is uh, the one that I have, which I like. And this just kind of visual, I'll just run you through last week what my family put in. So not everybody crushes the eggs, no problem. Garlic peels, bananas, avocado pit. Do not try to cut that. You'll hurt yourself avocado skin, um, lettuce, you don't need to chop, it breaks down. We generate a quarter pound of, of um, coffee grounds every day, so that can add up. Um, I put the nut holes in here, as you can see, um, more coffee grounds, a tea bag. Here you can see we're buying, try to buy tea bags without the staples, but if you have it, you know, the paper and the string is fine. And this way, about seven and a half pounds, the container weighs two pounds, so we're generating every time this thing is full about five pounds of, um, of uh, food scraps to put in the backyard. I've been, much to my family's chagrin, weighing my food scraps for more than a year, and uh, this is just my data from a family of four, but the total food scraps we generate is close to 14 pounds a week, and, uh, and I'm lucky enough to have curbs, weekly curbside collection of food scraps, so I'm putting uh, you know, 27% of that at the curb, but I have a couple of worm bins too. So, you know, 73% of my food scraps, no problem composting either with worms or in hot composting. So you will need um, 
a, a lot of browns to get set up, so you need to keep all the fall leaves. You cannot store food scraps, but you need to have this ready. Uh, in the winter, you can compost. This is just what I do. I move that bin that I store my leaves in over my system. A little insulation. If it's really cold, I'll throw an old camping blanket over it. Uh, consider convenience. Uh, my friend Susan, again, the master composter, she uses, made this bin that she puts her food scraps in, drilled some holes in it. You know, it's convenient to her kitchen. She does, when she puts food scraps, mixes it with, you know, two to three by volume of leaves and gets air in there so it begins the process but then when she's ready to mix it in her bigger compost system which is on the other side of her house from her kitchen um, you know it's just easier for her it's already begun so these are some tips now for setting up and maintaining your system you want to look at locating your bin that like i said convenient to your kitchen you need a water source you need good drainage you need room to move around uh, you want to have access to your tools if you have a pitchfork. I talked about building the pile. Air, so you're going to aerate, you're going to mix as needed. You're going to adjust the moisture. After about 8 to 12 weeks, you could be ready to harvest compost, and then you can screen. So there's several methods to filling your compost bin, and you'll have this presentation, um, so I'm not going to to read all this, but one is called the lasagna layering where you do browns, greens, browns, greens. Uh, you always want to cover the pile so no food scraps are visible. Another method which I like is to fill your bin with the browns, kind of make a little nest or hole, put your food scraps in, mix it up, always cover again, no food scraps showing. Um, even if you're using a tumbler, you can mix it in and then cover with a layer of, of carbon in your tumbler once you're done mixing to avoid, again, kind of just nuisance flies. Um, you want to think about the flow of the, the air through the pile and the base, and you want to have enough mass. So at least three feet by three feet by three, three feet is what's needed to get it hot, so one cubic yard. Um, moisture uh, is, is very critical. It, it's higher than what you might think that you need. You need 40 to 60 percent moisture in your pile. If it's too dry, the microbes go dormant. If it's um, too wet, they drown. It becomes anaerobic. So we have a simple squeeze test that we teach where you grab a handful of your, your pile mixture and you give it a squeeze. If it doesn't hold together, if it just kind of falls apart, clearly it's too dry. You want to get a few drips between your knuckles, um, but if you were to hold your hand up and it drips into your armpit, it's too wet, you don't have to do that. But it really should feel like a wrung out sponge. And as I said, as the pile heats up, um, you're going to need to add more moisture. And you don't water just on top. you got to water throughout. So moisture is really important. OK, I'm just going to say a word about, about rats. And, you know, many of you may not be in an area where this is an issue, but both of these articles near where I live in, in D.C. and Baltimore were just in the last week about how restaurants with, you know, so many restaurants are closed and the dumpsters, you know, are, uh, are not, the, you know, the rats are used to feeding on those dumpsters. So now there's a, an increase in rats. I haven't heard anything about issues with composting with the pandemic, but I just wanted you to to know that, you know, Follow best management practices, avoid that meat dairy, incorporate all the food into the pile, avoid clutter, um, avoid, you know, rats like clutter. So you want three feet around your system. Don't put your bin right up against um, the fence. We have uh, at least one webinar on successful rat prevention. It's oriented towards community scale composting, but you may find it useful. Another thing I recommend, some of these systems come with bases. You can order them. You, you just have to pay extra, but you could put hardware cloth staked out with tent stakes underneath it, quarter inch, which is what I do. So that can be useful. For troubleshooting, um, uh, for troubleshooting, just a few things here, you know, obviously if it's too dry, add water. If you have a bad odor, maybe there's not enough air. Uh, we have more troubleshooting tips on our, our website, so check that out. And so the last two few slides I have is really just how do you know when your compost is finished and, and how to use it. So when the pile no longer heats after mixing, you need to allow it to cure for about a month. And it should be, you know, it should be earthy smelling. It should be crumbly. It should be loose. It should have no recognizable 
you know, food in it, and it should have shrunk to about one third of its original volume. There's two tests that we uh, teach that you can do at your home without paying for expensive lab tests. One is the germination test, where you take a packet of seeds like parsley or watercress, you count out 100 seeds, you put a plate of moist compost, and you count how many germinate. So if it's supposed to have a germination rate of 85%, you want to be close to that. The other is called the respiration test. So you take a handful of what you think is your finished compost, you put it in a Ziploc bag, press out the air and seal, put it in a closet for three days. When you open it, make sure it's under your nose. If you smell ammonia, it's not ready yet. Okay, and um, this is a, a picture of just a system I'm using now. I've used a variety of systems and that's my black gold um, ready to take out of the bin and I'll let it cure in a pile outside um, and the top part might not be ready so I'll just kind of mix that in to the new pile. You may want to screen. Um, if you have a lot of compost you can build a screener like this. Mine is just uh, you know duct tape and a little hardware cloth. Um, I'm wearing a, a bandana as I'm screening and I'll just say that you know follow uh, health and safety protocols, you know, wash your hands. Uh, one thing to know is that there's a fungus that lives in soil decaying leaves and um, compost called Aspergillus fumigatus that um, some people can be allergic to and when you're screening it can become airborne. So we actually always recommend uh, if you've got any respiratory issues to wear an N95 mask but we know they're not available so you know wear something even if it's a bandana. And uh, the U.S. Composting Council has a fact sheet, the links there, about, you know, can you continue to compost at home during the pandemic? And the short answer is absolutely. The stuff that you screen out, you can put back in your compost pile. It's an, a great inoculant. This shows um, avocado pit and a mango pit. And one thing, they break down eventually. That avocado pit I broke open is uh, full of worms. And then this just shares how to use finished compost um, in your garden. So um, you can incorporate it into the soil, you can use it as a mulch. If your compost is not quite mature, do not uh, incorporate it into the soil, as I said, but you can use it as a mulch. So you'll, you'll have this. And, um, and, and uh, that's, that's it. So back to you, Linda. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Brenda. Um, so I think at this point, we're going to go ahead and start handing the controls over to Rhonda. Um, but uh, before I introduce her, um, I just wanted to address some of the questions that we were getting uh, during Brenda's presentation. Um, yes, the presentation will definitely be shared after the webinar. We will both email you a link and it will be available on our website. Um, we will also go ahead and link to some of the images that Brenda was using. Um, some of them are already on our website in different places, but we'll go ahead and um, make it easy for you to find them so you can share them. Uh, and uh, if you are having problems with audio, please let us know in the questions box. Um, it looked like a few of you were having some issues in the beginning. Not sure what exactly what was happening, but just know that you will get a recording um, which should include all of the audio. So keep us posted. Uh, but at this point, I'd love to introduce Rhonda to you. So Rhonda Sherman is an extension specialist in the Department of Horticulture Science at North Carolina State University in Raleigh, North Carolina. She is a leading authority and trainer on vermicomposting, teaching throughout the United States as well as abroad. Rhonda is the founder and director of a two-acre compost learning lab at the university. She convenes an annual international vermiculture conference and has authored over 65 publications on vermicomposting, composting, recycling, and waste reduction. She has an impressive and extensive website, so be sure to check it out as she will only scratch the surface today. Without further ado, take it away, Rhonda. Okay, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I wish I could see all of you. It's so exciting that people from all over the world are participating. So ILSR asked me to talk about vermicomposting at home. So, um, Brenda did a wonderful job of describing composting and I'm going to briefly describe vermicomposting and how different it is from composting. Okay, so, um, so a simple description of vermicomposting is that it's relying on earthworms and microorganisms to help stabilize 
organic materials and convert them into a valuable soil amendment and source of plant nutrients. So um, here's, this shows just brief comparisons between vermicomposting and composting. Normally with composting, it will take six to nine months. So, and, and I want to really point out the terminology here because people often will contact me, maybe in the subject line, it'll say composting. And then in the body of the message, they'll ask me about worm bins. So <laughs> keep in mind, vermicomposting and composting, two totally different things. So vermicomposting can be accomplished in two to three months and it keeps that mesophilic temperature range that Brenda pointed out. And I have it in a chart down here. So look at the bottom lower right of the screen, you'll see that in a compost pile, how the temperature starts out at ambient mesophilic temperature range. And then as it heats up, it gets into the high thermophilic range and then it drops back to the mesophilic range again. And so the microorganisms change from that, um, from going from mesophilic to thermophilic. So you end up with greater numbers and more variety of microorganisms during the mesophilic phase. And so that's what we maintain through vermicomposting. And with vermicomposting, you don't, you don't turn the bin um, whereas with composting, you have to aerate it by turning or, you know, introducing air in some way. All right, so big difference in the price of vermicompost and compost. So if, if you were going to manufacture compost and sell it for a cubic yard, you would get around $30 per cubic yard. Whereas vermicompost is selling for anywhere between $200 and $1,000 per cubic yard. So keep that in mind. Um, I always like to show this photo. This is a, a study we did at NC State with randomized plots. And some of the plots had zero vermicompost, some had 10% by volume, and others had 20% by volume vermicompost. And you can see huge differences. <laughs> so the the turnip on the left is a regular size turnip. The one in the middle just had 10% by volume vermicompost, which is a very small amount. But look at that root system, the size of the turnip and the greens, and then 30, or I'm sorry, 20% by volume. Look how much bigger that turnip is. And you may think, oh my goodness, if I use 50% or 100%, it would you know, just be enormous but it doesn't work that way. So a little bit of vermicompost goes a really long way and it, it's more effective at lower amounts. So keep that in mind. So very simply, and I encourage everybody that if you wanna get into vermicomposting at any stage, whether you wanna do it at home or in a classroom or take all of your cafeteria food waste at school or develop a business, maybe you have a thousand acres that you wanna do vermicomposting on, it all starts with this, because what you need to learn is animal husbandry, all right? So you, um, so you always wanna start with just one pound of worms and you're going to learn how to take care of them and help them to thrive. So you buy a pound of worms, and then you either build, before you do that, you build or buy a worm bin. So in the upper right, you can see that, you know, there was a shipping box and they just kind of broke it in two and they made worm bins out of it. Um, and in the lower left, you'll see stacking bins. The one on the right is called can of worms. The one on the left is a worm factory. Um, and those ease in harvesting the vermicompost. In the lower right, we have the urban worm bag, which a lot of people like. And then in the upper left, we have homemade worm bins. So, you know, I spent $5 on those bins. I think the one on the bottom is a 10 gallon bin. Uh, the one on top is an 18 gallon bin. 
So you can just get those very inexpensively and then put your own air holes into it. All right, next you want to add bedding. Uh, worms need a moist environment. And so the bedding provides something for them to live in. They can live and thrive in this stable bedding environment. They'll keep things moist and dark. And so um, I've got pictures of shredded office paper and then cardboard, leaves, finished compost, shredded newspaper, and then in the lower left is coconut core. A lot of people like coconut core. Um, it works well in a worm bin, uh, but you really need to consider the carbon footprint. Unless you grow coconuts in your area, then you're importing it from overseas. Okay, next we wanna add composting earthworms. So they are earthworms, but they're different from what you expect, okay? When people think of worms, they think as, you know, worms that are underground, that when you dig, you find worms. And there are over 9,000 species of earthworms and they live at different levels. And the ones you wanna use for vermicomposting do not live underground. You'll find them in piles of manure. You'll find them under decaying leaves. You might find them at the bottom of a compost bin that is um, curing. So these are composting earthworms. And the, the most popular worldwide is a species called Isenia fetida. And it has many common names. And unfortunately, with common names, people think they're talking about different species of worms. But, you know, Isenia fetida is what you want. It's probably most commonly known as red wigglers here in the United States. In other countries, they call them California red worms for some reason. <laughs> but it's Isenia fetida. They adapt more readily to a wide range of environmental conditions. So they're very good for vermicomposting. You want to buy them from a reputable worm grower. And so again, check reviews online um, because you want to make sure you're going to get a whole pound of worms. You want to order a pound for Isenia fetida, there should be about a thousand. So when you get your worms, you're not going to count a thousand worms. Nobody would want to do that but you can just eyeball it and you can tell a big difference between 30 worms or 300 worms or a thousand worms, okay? So just keep that in mind. Uh, the, the worms are sensitive to temperatures and they're most productive between 55 to 85 degrees Fahrenheit. By productive, I mean they're gonna eat the most, they're gonna um, which means they're going to excrete the most vermicompost and they're going to um, reproduce most between those temperatures. And so, um, but does that mean that you can't do this outdoors? No, um, it means that they will survive outside of that range. I've had them survive at below 10 degrees Fahrenheit and above 100 degrees Fahrenheit, but they do slow down. And so there are many ways that you can help um, the bin environment be more comfortable for the worms. And I talk about that quite a bit in my book. And again, I mentioned that the worms need a lot of moisture. So pop quiz, if any of you remember what um, Brenda talked about for outdoor compost bins, she said that you need 40 to 60% moisture, right? But with worms, you need more moisture. The worms breathe through their skin. So they need 70 to 80% moisture. All right, next we're gonna add food scraps. I like to always keep a three-prong garden tool next to my worm bin, no matter what size it is. So lower left, you'll see what a three-prong garden tool looks like. You're gonna pull back the bedding, Put in some food, a small amount of food, and then you're going to cover it with bedding. You'll see that I mentioned covering twice in this slide, and it's because 
If you cover it, then you won't have any odor and you won't attract fruit flies. And I mean cover it so you cannot see the food. And Brenda talked about that for outdoor composting too, that if you encase the food in bedding, then you're not gonna have problems. And ideally you should wait until the food is gone before adding more. All right, so this is a pile of food scraps. Um, <laughs> so there are a number of things that are suitable for a worm bin. Um, and then there are um, some things you would not wanna put in a worm bin. And the publication I'm gonna tell you about at the end of this um, presentation gives you kind of a list of things you could add to your worm bin. But the things you wouldn't wanna add, just like with outdoor um, thermophilic composting, you would not wanna add meat, grease, bones, or dairy products. Um, again, because you know it produces odor and it attracts carnivores. Dog or cat poo is not a good idea. I mean, if you wanted to do that separately as a separate um, <laughs> endeavor where you're gonna be super safe and then you're gonna use it only for ornamentals and not edible food, that is something you could pursue separately, but don't just put that into a worm bin. Um, in a small worm bin, like what I'm talking about today, um, it's not a good idea to put citrus. It's fine in a larger worm bin, and it's fine in an outdoor composting bin, okay? It's just in a really small environment, like the bins I've shown you, it's not a good idea to have citrus. <clears throat> and the worms are sensitive to salt, and sugar can attract ants, so, you know, go slow. Uh, you know, don't put that in there. And then you'll find that the worms seem to be picky eaters. And so again, in a large vermicomposting system, things are much more forgiving. But in a small system, you might notice that the worms are shying away from onions and garlic and kimchi and, you know, very spicy things. So just keep that in mind. All right, so collecting food scraps. Um, Brenda already showed you um, several examples of containers you can use. I'm adding, you know, reusing a container, but the top left is the way I do it now because I've been composting and vermicomposting for decades. And um, I happen to like to put my food waste in the freezer. So I spent a whole dollar on each of these bins, they're plastic bins called shoe boxes. <laughs> and for a dollar, you can buy them. There's no lid, you don't need a lid. So you don't have to fiddle with a lid and waste time with that. So, you know, whenever I have any kind of food waste or, you know, laundry lint or whatever, it just goes in the freezer. All right, so, um, you know, you, you vermicompost, again, my publication talks about that. It's got a troubleshooting guide, but eventually you're gonna wanna remove the vermicompost that's accumulating on the bottom. So you'll notice in the bottom of your worm bin, you'll see what appears to be compost or soil that's just accumulating in the bottom. Um, it doesn't have, it shouldn't have an odor. Um, and, so I'm going to show you three different ways of separating it the, from the worms, okay, of removing it. So you'll take your little worm bin, and um, this is not for the, the urban worm bag, which I showed you a picture of that. Um, this is if you have one of those other worm bins in the photo, that you're going to empty it upside down. The mono bins I showed were, you know, like the blue bins that I showed. You're just going to empty it turn it upside down, empty the contents onto an old uh, shower curtain or a tarp, and, the, and then you're gonna fill the bin halfway with moist bedding of your choice. And then the worms are gonna be moving away from the light. And so any vermicompost you find, you're gonna put in your container labeled black gold. And any um, worms or bedding, old bedding that you find will go back into the bin. When I do this by myself, it usually takes 60 to 90 minutes. Another way is called sideways separation. And with that, you, you do everything I described. You're, you're putting food in various places in the bin 
for several months and you'll finally notice that the vermicompost is kind of building up on the bottom. And so um, you'll decide, I'm gonna try this sideways separation of harvesting. And so you start only feeding on one half of the bin, okay? So for this, you can see that now they've decided to start feeding only on the right side of the bin. They're carefully covering their food waste so you don't see any food waste. And the other side is where the vermicompost is and um, you want it to kind of dry out, okay? So you will fluff that side sometimes and you won't add any liquid. By the way, if you do have to add liquid, it should only be sprayed. You know, like a spray bottle just spritz it, just mist it, okay? So the next way is vertical separation. And for that, you either get, um, you know, I showed a picture of two different stacking bins. You can buy those, they cost a hundred bucks. So, you know, um, but they work great. So, you know, it's up to you what you wanna do. Um, or you can go this way with the blue bin on the, to the left side, you just buy two of those bins. And you do your vermicomposting in one bin while the other one is just, you know, sitting in storage. And then when, as the vermicompost starts to build up in the bottom of the bin, and it gets to the point where you can put the top bin on top of it, then you only start feeding in the top bin and will move up into that bin. And with both the vertical and the horizontal methods, it's going to take a few weeks. Okay, they're not like cats and dogs who are like, oh wow, that's where the food is. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna beeline up there. It's not like that. So, um, but you would just ignore that bottom bin, and the worms will move from the bottom bin into the top bin, and then after a few weeks or so, you can just remove the vermicompost from that lower bin, and then that upper bin becomes your regular working worm bin. And then on the right, the can of worms, you start in one tray, okay? I think some people have the misconception that this is increasing the amount of vermicomposting you're doing, but you just work in one tray. And when it's time, you move to the second tray. So this would be the only working tray. And then they are at a third level, which isn't necessary, but you can by the time most of the worms get to the third tray, they should totally have vacated the first. So, so anyway, so vermicompost has an amazing effect on plants, as you can imagine, because you saw the difference in the, in the prices for selling vermicompost and compost. So vermicompost is more microbially active than what the worm ate. It has a fine particulate structure good moisture holding capacity, nutrients in forms that are readily taken up by plants, and it has plant growth hormones and humic and fulvic acids. So seeds will germinate much more quickly when you add um, you know, 10, 20% by volume vermicompost to soil. The plants will grow faster and healthier. It'll increase the crop yields and also repel insects and diseases. So keep in mind that vermicomposting is a shallow process. So what you saw from Brenda about the backyard composting, where she, remember she said you want one cubic yard, ideally of working space, three feet by three feet by three feet. But with vermicomposting, it needs to be only about 20 inches deep. Okay, it's a very shallow process. So to find out more information about vermicomposting, go to my website, here it is right here. And on the website, you'll find videos and podcasts. Um, most of the information is about vermicomposting because people in 116 countries have contacted me about vermicomposting. So. Um, that's what I, you know, by popular demand, that's what I devote most of my attention to. I do have information about composting, small and large scale um, as well on this website. But the information I just went over can be found in Worms Can Recycle Your Garbage. Okay, so you'll look at, for that under four households under the vermicomposting section of my website. 
Um, for any of you who work with youth, I also have a Burma composting curriculum. It's got six chapters with two activities in each chapter. And so that's a great thing for working with schools and after school and 4-H and church groups and scout groups. So look for that. This is all free, by the way. And then large-scale Burma composting. Lots of information about that as well. So, and then um, for the large-scale Burma composting, I just want to point out that I do have this book published by Chelsea Green, and it's called The Worm Farmer's Handbook, Mid to Large-Scale Burma Composting for Farms, Businesses, Municipalities, Schools, and Institutions. And within that, I cover all sorts of things that have to do with doing Burma composting on a larger level than what I just described to you on this webinar. So check that out. And I want to thank you for your time today. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Rhonda. Um, and uh, we are going to go ahead and get to your questions. Uh, but before we do that, uh, I wanted to invite all of you still on the line uh, to show us some love. Um, if you like the free resources that ILSR makes available, including this webinar, uh, please consider donating. Uh, no amount is too big or too small, and it will be very meaningful to us. Um, you can do that on our website, ilsr.org forward slash donate. Uh, so now we're going to see if we can do couple of general polling questions before we start um, asking um, our presenters some of the questions that you submitted. So we'll see if Virginia can get those up. Um, give her a second to do that. Great. So after this webinar, how inclined are you to select one or all of the, as many of the following as is relevant? Uh, improve my current composting, start, hum, start hot composting, start warm composting, learn more about composting, or support composting. Alrighty. Results, it's a pretty good mix, but a lot of you uh, are ready to improve your current composting, aren't we all? There's always more to learn. Uh, all right, the next question. Uh, as an introduction to the basics of composting at home for both uh, outside composting and worm composting, this webinar had select one of the following. Too much information, the right amount of information, or not enough information. So this is your chance to give us some feedback, which is very meaningful to us. All right, overwhelmingly, you all are being very kind, saying that this was the right amount of information, thank you. Um, and it is always a bit of a challenge to make sure that this information is as broadly applicable and helpful as possible, but thank you all. Um, so at this point, uh, I'd like to go ahead and ask our presenters some, some questions. Uh, first one, something that I think I've heard Rhonda talk about, and I know Brenda and I talk about it some extent uh, when we do trainings. There was a question about selling leachate, compost leachate. So I was wondering if uh, Rhonda, you could start by letting us know whether people sell compost leachate or not. They should absolutely not sell leachate. <laughs> you should not even use leachate. Leachate means that you put excess liquid into your system. And so, it comes out the bottom and it's usually anaerobic, stinky, um, unknown amount of nutrients. It could have excess salts. It could have pathogens. It's not something that you want to use on plants. Will plants, will you see increased plant growth if you use it? Yes, you will. But what, again, what are you putting on your plants? So if you want to apply liquid, um, enriched liquid to your plants, then make 
tea, make compost tea or vermicompost tea or use a com combination of vermicompost and compost, but you carefully brew it in using clean equipment and you don't add sugars and then it just, um, it will put nutrients and microbes from the finished compost or vermicompost into this liquid solution and that is very benef that can be very beneficial for plants. And you can apply it as a soil drench or apply it as, as a foliar spray. Great. Thank you, Rhonda. Brenda, do you have anything to add to that? Nope. <laughs> it covers it pretty well. Basically, we just tell people uh, leachate is not compost tea. Those are two different things. So just important message we wanted y'all to leave with. Uh, Brenda, a question may be directed for you. Um, there were a couple of questions about why we're recommending not composting uh, tissues or paper towels at this point in time. Yeah, I mean, you know, with the, you know, we have this pandemic going around and so there's a number of people who are sick, not using, you know, not showing symptoms. So again, this notion of just erring on the side of caution right now, you know, a lot of home, composters in their backyard are not reaching those thermophilic temperatures. I mentioned you need 131 degrees for three days straight. So I'm just recommending don't put your tissues in. Um, usually paper towels are fine, but a lot of people are using paper towels now as disinfectants with Clorox bleach and whatnot, you know, and cleaning surfaces. So that recommendation is just more temporary right now during the pandemic. It's just really an abundance of caution. Um, great. Uh, I think that that works as an answer. Um, uh, and so a question for for both of you, and we'll start with Rhonda. Um, there were an, a few questions about working with different age groups or different generations um, in, in the composting process. Um, so Rhonda, maybe you could talk a little bit about any tips or ideas for working with kids or perhaps the older generation or elderly, um, if you have any thoughts on either of those age groups. Yes, well, certainly with vermicomposting, I've found that all ages get really excited about working with worms. So, um, and you know, it's an easy thing to do. For, for older people, I, I will tell you that a worm bin can, can uh, get heavy, you know, so, so I like to use a 14 gallon worm bin when I'm using a small worm bin. Um, and so, you know, but it can be done by anybody with any kind of ability. I also have a back problem and I do backyard composting and I'm not able to, you know, turn the materials in my bin very thoroughly just because of my back problem, but I still can kind of stir it up you know, with my digging fork. So, so you learn ways to adapt. And with kids, um, you know, they go crazy about worms. They love it. Um, there's an activity where you can just put um, a, a small amount of worms on a moistened paper towel and just let the kids examine the worms and they have so much fun. So that's, I think on page 13 of my curriculum, is a great activity where, you know, if you want to ask the kids, you know, questions to observe about the worms, you can, but, you know, they will entertain themselves for <laughs> quite a while just looking at worms. That's and great. I'll, Brenda, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'll just add that, um, you know, I know a number of you are teachers actually, and uh, not only does Rhonda have curriculum, but we have on our composting on site at schools, K through 12 schools on our link, we'll send it out to you all. Um, we have links to all, a lot of school districts and other curriculum on the soil, soil and composting and activities. I would just say, you know, that's kind of curriculum stuff, but hands-on with the composting is great. You can, I didn't show a picture of this, but there's a one particular tum tumbler, probably more than one, where it's more like a ball and you can roll it around. Um, so it, that's that's a great option if you have kids because, you know, they love doing that kind of turning and, a, and you know, it's like a big, big ball, right? And um, the other thing that kids, you know, love is, 
you know, you can gauge them in, and a lot of community compost sites do this too when they're giving, you know, and have volunteers just screening the compost, is screening it out is a really easy thing, especially for younger kids. And um, if you have a microscope, it's just fabulous to show them all the living biology and connecting compost back to the soil and growing local food. If you're gardening and growing food that the kids like, you know, whether it's blueberries or cherry tomatoes or sugar snap peas, you know, just, you know, exposing them to the wonder of converting food scraps into compost back into soil to grow new food for them is it's just great to be able to do that at this time when we are all stuck at home looking for activities to gauge in you know think outside the box and when we get back to schools um, there's a lot you we can be promoting within the community at community gardens and school gardens and whatnot so we're hoping to answer all your questions about that in the uh, coming coming months and years Great, thank you both. And I'll just add that um, in addition to the actual, uh, actual composting processes of getting kids and other folks involved at that stage, um, getting kids involved in the waste auditing process or even just like weighing of how many food scraps are getting composted or how much of your trash is made up of stuff that can be composted. Uh, there's a lot of math that can be kind of brought in um, for basic lessons and proportions and volumes and so on. So there's lots of lessons to be pulled. Um, but uh, a question for both of you, another question for both of you. Um, there's a few questions about how weather and location kind of affect the composting process. So Rhonda, maybe starting with you, like inside versus outside for worm bins and how weather considerations play into uh, how you manage your system. Uh, yeah, definitely. So um, a lot of people do it, do vermicomposting inside, especially, you know, if you're in an apartment, there are so many different places where you can put a worm bin. I know people who make a lovely coffee table for their living room that's a worm bin. I've known people, well, I used to keep my worm bin in my bathroom. I've kept it in my crawl space. I've kept it in, um, you know, bedroom all over the place. So um, a worm bin, if you're doing things correctly, it, it won't smell, there won't be any odor. So, you know, you really can use it as a coffee table. Um, and, but I usually keep my worm bin outdoors nowadays. And so I always keep it in the shade. I don't let direct sunlight fall on the worm bin because that could heat, a, heat it up. But, um, you know, there, there are just a number of things you can do to help support your worm bin from getting too hot or too cold. It's, it's pretty easy. And so, um, and then I keep my backyard composting bin in the shade too. And with a compost bin, you can't do it indoors. So keep that in mind, you have to do it outdoors. And uh, Brenda, any thoughts on, there, there are some questions specific to like how out, outdoor temperature affects the composting process and the, how hot your compost will get. Yeah, so, you know, you can compost year round. I will just say that things tend to slow down in the winter, especially if you're in a really, really cold climate. Um, you can, as I sh showed you, you know, there's different ways you can help insulate it to keep it going, but really the, the heat in your compost comes from making the microbes happy and feeding them right, the air, the moisture, you know, the right carbon and nitrogen balance will get your pile hot. There's a wonderful video from a group in Vermont called AgriLab that shows in the middle of a Vermont winter, a hot tub outside filled with snow and they ran a, a hose through a compost pile and the water coming out of the hose in the winter is coming into the hot tub and somebody's in the hot tub. So it's just a great visual to show you can compost in the winter. Um, I think putting your bin in the shade is a good idea if you're like in a hot state like Arizona, you know, that's going to be really important to pay attention to moisture if it's really hot. Um, so you, do, you don't need sunlight even in the winter. You can try to insulate it, um, you know, put a higher level of um, 
a biofilter or, or browns on top of your food scraps to help prevent it from kind of freezing on top. When you get into your bin, there's nothing harder than trying to break into a frozen crust, you know, so that's why I think insulating it a little bit can help so you can do it in, um, you know, year round. So yeah, you can do it year round. Great. Um, a question um, uh, for Rhonda. Um, there was a question about uh, when folks get ready or are getting ready to leave for a couple of weeks, say on vacation, um, what steps, is, is that okay? Uh, what steps should they yes. take to prepare for that? Yes, you do not need a warm sitter when you go on vacation. That's great. Um, you just add a little bit more food than you normally would. So I've been away for three or even four weeks and the worms are just fine. So you really don't have to worry about that. The bedding that the worms are in, they will eat it. They eat it more slowly than they do the food waste you add. So there's you know, plenty of bedding for them to eat. Like I said, you can add a little bit more food waste, but also they will re-ingest their castings. So the worms will be fine while you're on vacation. Good news for all of us having lives outside of composting at home. Uh, a question for you, Brenda, about sort of managing the number of piles that you might have at home and sort of, uh, you know, how to maintain a batch of compost. Um, whether you need more than one pile, can it be done kind of in one pile? Yeah, this is a great question. I mean, it's, I showed the different varieties, like the multi bin cubes, if you will, are really nice if you have a lot of material to be able as one fills up to kind of flip it. The process of flipping it from one cube to another, if you're using a system like that, is it does aerate it, mix it, get it going again, and then gives you more space. Um, if you're using a, a tumbler, you know, it, you really fill it up and when it's full and you can't add any more, I mean, it's, it, it breaks down through the process. So just when you think it's full, it's not really full, so it can handle a lot, but at some point you're gonna want it to finish so you can use it in, you know, a couple of months. So you may prefer not to keep adding it, you want it to finish. So, you know, if it's, you can either have, you know, move it to some kind of outdoor area if most of the food particles are gone, you know, like, you know, before adding more, um, or you might get it one of those, uh, a tumbler with uh, dual compartments, like I showed. Um, the stationary systems, the plastic stationary systems that I'm, the one I'm currently using, you can harvest from the bottom. I only have one of those, so it works well to have one. So you can, you can do it with one. A lot of it just depends how much material you have. Two systems gives you more flexibility. There's no no doubt about it. So, so you don't you don't need to if you have a, just a little bit of space, you know, not much, you know, on a back deck or whatnot. You might look at a tumbler with a dual compartment to just make it easier for you. Great. Um, uh, there was a question about um, what if you find yourself having more food scraps than you can fit in your Worm comp or your vermicomposting bin um, or your hot composting bin. I don't know if it's as much an issue for the hot composting, but Rhonda, do you have any thoughts on managing? Yes, I, I highly recommend having a backyard composting bin in addition to your worm bin. Um, it's a larger space, it's more forgiving, you know, so you can put a lot more food in there. Like I said, you can put citrus and other things that you, you know, are really not so great for a small worm bin. And so I love having a backyard bin in addition to a worm bin. And if you think, well, why would I bother having a worm bin? Think about the value of the <laughs> vermicompost. Remember 200 to $1,000 per cubic yard for vermicompost versus $30 per cubic yard for compost. So. I keep that in mind. And so I'm very careful with my worm bin. And then I, you know, add, just add a lot more to my backyard bin and I don't worry about it. And um, and so one thing that wasn't mentioned I, is that for my backyard bin, when I add food waste to my backyard composting bin, I will sprinkle some me meal form of high nitrogen on top of it. And my food waste just disappears so quickly if I do that. So 
on my website, you'll, you'll click on composting, backyard composting, and you'll find my backyard five page composting publication. And I, I give you a list of, I don't know, I think seven different types of high nitrogen meals. I use blood meal, but alfalfa meal, a number of other things can really help that food waste disappear very quickly. And I'll just add uh, real quickly that you can have too much food scraps even for your outside hot composting system. You need, as I said before, you're going to get ammonia or nitrous oxide odor problems if you your nitrogen rich materials over you know you've too much of that compared to your carbon. So you know if you don't have carbon and browns to mix with your food scraps, you cannot compost your food scraps outside. So that is really critical to source those, store them, have them readily available. And you know, one thing I've learned from, from Rhonda with the worms is that's one of the biggest problems in a worm bin is overfeeding. If you have a, you know, the Isenia fetida worms eat what, 25 to 35% of, of their body weight a day. So if you have a pound of worms, they can only eat a quarter to a third of a pound of food scraps a day, and you don't want to overfeed your bin. So I'm glad whoever asked that asked that, and uh, pay attention to that. Wonderful. Well, thank you both, um, and thank you everyone for participating. Uh, this is by far the largest group I think we've had on a webinar at one time, so uh, thank you all for being a part of it and uh, look for us to send you a link to the recording in the, the coming days, but otherwise, um, happy composting and stay in touch. Take care, everyone. Thank you, Linda. Thank you.